If you're the business partner or product owner of a software product, you've likely heard many times that modifications or improvements to APIs are what enable new features and developments. Clearly they're important. Clearly they allow us to build great things, but what are they exactly? Today I want to translate exactly what APIs are, how they work, and why their quality is so significant when it comes to building out powerful, flexible business solutions. Let's start by defining terms, shall we? API stands for Application Programming Interface. So basically, it's a piece of software that acts as an interface between two systems, allowing those two systems to communicate information meaningfully back and forth. Imagine for a moment that you're visiting the Library of Congress. You approach a library aide and request a specific book. The aide prepares a reading room and grants you access to that book. You didn't directly walk up to the shelves and start leafing through. The aide served the book you requested directly to you. If you instead asked for books on a certain topic, the aide may have responded with two to three books that they felt fit your request, something you couldn't have done alone as easily. Now, had you asked for a confidential book instead, or a thousand books at once, your request would have likely been denied, as the aide follows a very stringent set of rules when answering the requests of visitors. In this scenario, you're essentially acting as an end-user application, often referred to as a client. The library of books is a database of information, and the library aide serving you is the API between you both. The aid acted as a knowledgeable intermediary with considerably more access than a visitor would be given for both security and feasibility purposes. We can't have visitors accessing restricted content, and we can't have thousands of visitors always filling the aisles of the library as it would slow the whole system down. APIs offer controls around information handling for technological systems. When it comes to building intuitive live services, we need to rely on APIs for these primary reasons. Now, while an API can exist between any two pieces of software, the most common ones that we'll be talking about today are known as experience APIs, as they're catered to support given, expected, user-facing services. And they're typically reachable via the internet, so why don't we talk about an actual API you may be familiar with? When you open the music app on your phone, nearly every screen interaction sends network requests from your phone to an API at your music provider. Retrieving songs, album covers, track details, and the like is all possible thanks to that API you're connected to. You request a song, and the API streams it to your device. Once you're done listening, it's gone. Sort of. Often, caching comes into play with streaming, but we're not going to go down that road in this video. Before we used APIs for our music services, you had to keep all your song files locally on your phone or MP3 player. Before that, it meant CDs, cassette tapes, 8-track, or vinyl records. If these physical devices broke, you'd have to repurchase and re-obtain all the songs manually. With modern streaming services today, if your phone dies and you replace it, all your songs are retained as they were never exclusively on your device in the first place. They were being served to you, thanks in part to an API. APIs aren't all-in-one services that do everything, though. In fact, most of them work in tandem with other APIs to produce desired outcomes for their users. When you open the link to this video, a collection of APIs serve the video straight to you, along with all the other details on this screen right now. It served the video itself, the comments, likes, and links to other recommended videos at the side as well. When you click the subscribe button below and enable the bell icon for this channel, an API will respond to your request, and then another API will let you know whenever I post new videos in the future. Feel free to try that one out now if you'd like. So returning to the music app, you likely connected to one API behind the scenes to log in and a totally different one to then retrieve your favorite playlists. While the network requests from your phone to the APIs went to the same general place, it's likely that multiple services worked together behind the scenes to bring you the experience you requested. This separation of duties is 
common practice when designing robust systems for several reasons. Specialized APIs can be focused on performing their singular task as efficiently as possible instead of acting as jack-of-all-trades systems. Essentially, there are three main categories that these APIs fall under. Experience, process, and system or data APIs. The differences are in the names, but let's break them down anyway. Experience APIs are as they sound. They're catered to an expected experience and tend to sit within the outer ring of APIs at a company. If you're an external consumer, you typically interact with experience APIs first. Client user facing applications talk to experience APIs first and foremost. While they don't perform business logic, aggregating or modifying the data they serve to those clients, they are designed with full context of the consumer applications they service. Process APIs often sit behind experience APIs as the worker APIs. They often massage and restructure data using business logic to place that data into a format that can later be read by experience APIs. Automation, batching, conversion, large scale calculated information, all that takes place within process APIs. And then finally you have system APIs, which sit behind process APIs as the de facto data stewards when it comes to the raw data in your system, which is why they're often referred to as data APIs. You could think of these as interfaces to the raw fields in your databases. They are the keepers of the keys and the true backend systems of record for information. By splitting up the jobs of the APIs into these layers, you gain a lot of value. It also allows you to scale systems that may need more size or throughput without scaling your entire system. The login API that lets you edit your user profile likely gets hit far less often than, say, the API that serves songs. This means that different amounts of resources are needed for each to do its job effectively. It also separates your work logically into differing systems so as not to overcomplicate a single API. And as a result, it allows portions of your system to remain highly reusable. From a security perspective, you also want to make careful considerations when partitioning your API duties as exposure of some features to external parties shouldn't be mingled in with internal facing features used solely by your company. You don't want APIs that surface confidential or restricted information exposing that data to the outside world in an unintended manner, so you keep them locked behind multiple layers of process and security. So APIs are useful for many reasons, but how can we tell the good from the bad and how can we ourselves strive to create the best APIs possible? Well, we can begin by focusing on who the actual consumer of the API is and <laughs> plot twist coming, it's not your music listening consumer or library bookworm. Remember that API stands for application programming interface. And on average, they're consumed by software developers writing programs. While the end user may interact with the music app by touching a user interface on their phone, that user interface code is what's talking to the API, not your finger on the screen. This means that good APIs need to be easily consumed and understood by software developers. As a developer myself, when I go to use an API I've never seen before, I can quickly determine if its maintainer had me in mind when I go to use it. Does it have up-to-date documentation to explain why and how it works? Does it have any example code to show me how to quickly get up and running with common use cases and requests? Does the API follow modern architectural patterns such as REST? Does it adhere to common best practices recognized by the developer community at large? Further, once I begin using the API, does it respond in a reasonable amount of time? When I give it a predictable input, do I receive a predictable output? Is the format of the data coming back from the API easy to read and utilize? Can I subscribe to updates from the API so it pushes results to me asynchronously? Or do I need to pull it for new information every X number of seconds? These are all vital questions to ask before you go standing up and exposing your API to others. For after all, nothing is worth building if built poorly. So, you now know what APIs are, what they're used for, how they can be dedicated to different types of functions in a system, and some good expectations to have of APIs before you consume or build them. So then, how does one build one, and what needs to be kept in mind while you go about their creation? 
honestly, sounds like a topic for the next video, so I can further dig into the best practices and key considerations of API design. If you enjoyed this video and would like me to continue the topic, drop me a like and leave me a comment about what you thought. That's it for now. Until next time, I'm Jeff Godwin, and I thank you for a moment of your time.